A welcome to today's All of Nation effort to beat COVID-19, what's happening in Alabama. My name is Frank Cullen, and I'm with the Global Innovation Policy Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank everyone for taking time from their busy schedules to join us today what is sure to be a fascinating discussion. And we're, of course, particularly honored to have Congresswoman Terry Sewell with us uh, as our featured speaker. Uh, I want to thank our partners at the Selma Chamber of Commerce for all their great work on today's event, but also for everything they do to help the business community and all residents of Selma and the greater Alabama region. At the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, We've long understood the important role intellectual property and innovation play in driving our economy, creating jobs, and making sure that we improve people's qualities of life. It's never been more important to have innovation than during this pandemic and during this time of crisis for our country. It's remarkable that today marks the first day that people will begin having the opportunity to have a vaccine for COVID-19, something that's been done in record time and with amazing cooperation between government, industries, and the entire private sector. At the Global Innovation Policy Center, we work with policymakers and with different folks in industry to try to ensure that people understand the important contributions made by the various companies that comprise the intellectual property sectors. And of course, that includes the pharma companies, uh, the entertainment companies that are helping us stay sane during this crazy time, uh, the folks in our technology sector who connect us and make virtual events like today possible, and also the manufacturers and others uh, who provide us with all the goods we need, including the important uh, personal protective equipment and other uh, necessary devices that are helping us through this crisis. At GIPC, we start an initiative to really highlight the important role that industry and government are playing to help us get through this crisis. And so today, we're happy to hold this virtual event to have a chance to really dive into these issues. Uh, it's important to note that the intellectual property sectors contribute over 45, create over 45 million jobs, contribute over half of our uh, trade from the United States, and also generate 38% plus for our GDP. So very important contributions, but nothing more important than the innovation that's occurring right now to get us through this crisis and give us new vaccines and treatments. It's now my honor and great pleasure to introduce our very special guest, Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Congressman Sewell is in her fifth term representing Alabama's seventh congressional district. And the Congressman serves on the very important uh, Ways and Means Committee. She's the vice chair of the committee and she brings more than 15 years of experience as a securities and public finance attorney to the committee. She also has been a real champion for her constituents and is seen as a real leader in Congress. In addition to serving as vice chair, she sits on three subcommittees, the Subcommittee on Health, which is never more relevant than today, the Subcommittee on Trade, which of course is so important to all of us, and the Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support, all tremendously important subcommittees. The Congressman was also selected by Democratic leadership to serve as a Chief Deputy Whip, whip and serves on the Steering and Policy Committee, which sets the policy direction of the Democratic Caucus. Congressman Sewell is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, where she's the co-chair of the Voting Rights Task Force, never more important than in this recent election. She's a vice chair of the New Democratic Coalition. And as I said before, not only is she a leader and respected voice in Congress, but she's there to get things done on behalf of her constituents and the American people. She's the type of leader we need in Congress, and we're so honored she's taking time from her busy schedule to be with us. The Congresswoman is an honors graduate of Princeton University and Oxford University in England and received her law degree from Harvard Law School. Uh, none of those are easy accomplishments and she should be commended for taking time from what could otherwise be a very lucrative private sector career to devote herself to public service. So thank you, Congresswoman, for all you're doing. Thank you for joining us today. We're delighted to have you with us and we really look forward to your comments. Uh, Congresswoman Sewell, I'm sure our attendees would welcome hearing some of your insights on how the pandemic and this current crisis are affecting the constituents in your district and also your important work in Congress. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that the chamber is deeply grateful for all you've done for the business community, but also to help 
with everyday uh, people getting through this crisis by providing much necessary financial relief and also a lot of the support for the research and development that's leading us to new cures and this vaccine. So Congressman Sewell, it's my pleasure to ask you to share some of your thoughts and look forward to our discussion in just a few moments. Congressman Sewell. Thank you so much, Frank, uh, and the United States, uh, the U.S. Chamber for uh, this invitation. I uh, am very grateful uh, to um, the chambers in my district uh, who add such important support and leadership uh, in the communities that I represent. A very special thanks to uh, Cheryl Smedley and those from the Selma Dallas County Chamber of Commerce for your support, leadership, and participation in today's event. It is an honor every day for me to represent my home district and especially my hometown of Selma, Alabama. Uh, 2020 has truly been a very difficult year with the COVID-19 pandemic threatening our very lives and livelihood. It's without a doubt that the biggest threat that we've had in a century to our public health, which has caused a huge crisis, uh, economic crisis, uh, ensuing because of the public health crisis. The chamber, as well as uh, the entire community, has played a critical role in helping our communities, our families, our workers, employees, and consumers during this challenging year. From families to small business owners, now more than ever, we have needed every part of our community from our nonprofit, our faith-based organizations, our healthcare professionals, our food service industry, and the like, working together in every community to help us survive this pandemic. When the pandemic first hit in March, there was a mad rush to do everything we could to minimize the damage to our health and to our economy. We in Congress passed the Families First Act and then the CARES Act, uh, to uh, two major forms of legislation to help keep people and businesses afloat. The Paycheck Protection Program bought $6 billion to Alabama businesses, and the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loans brought an additional $2 billion. But there were billions of dollars of CARES Act that came flowing into Alabama for testing, contact tracing, and treatment. For example, over $845 billion of CARES COVID relief funding for Alabama's hospitals and providers, $124 million worth of COVID relief for our nursing homes, as well as $22 million in COVID relief funding for children's hospitals, as well as money that went into our community health centers and the like. It was really important to me to make sure that every part of my, uh, of my district from the urban Birmingham, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa to the rural um, Selma and the surrounding uh, Black Belt counties, that everyone got the resources they need in order to not only survive, but try to thrive during this very important uh, and historic moment in American history. Of course, uh, here in Congress, our main focus was on trying to contain the spread of the virus and helping to ensure the fair and equitable rollout of what has uh, what we hopefully will um, see as the, uh, the, the approved vaccines. Um, but as the pandemic rages on, our focus has been on providing continued support to individuals, to businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic. Negotiations are ongoing in Congress. Uh, Americans need help and they need help now. I know that my constituents uh, are uh, feeling the uh, food insecurity uh, threatened 12 million Americans are threatened to be kicked off of the unemployment rolls. Uh, likewise, we see eviction crisis and bills mounting up. Small businesses are still shuddering uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. And so we in Congress must come up with another COVID relief package uh, before we recess uh, for Christmas. And I look forward uh, to being a part of that uh, effort in order to make sure that we receive the kind of uh, help that we need. As, a, as Christmas approaches, we're running out of time. 
Last week, we passed a continuing resolution until December 18th to keep government open. My constituents, I know, can't wait for a COVID relief package to come. As of Friday, Alabama had as many as 288,000 cases of COVID-19, 27,000 hospitalizations, and over 4,000 deaths. We know that these are not just numbers, that these are our neighbors, these are our friends, our church, church members, and our family members. It's critically important that Congress provides another round of relief. This afternoon, we anticipate a two-part plan being introduced on the Senate side by Senators Cassidy and, um, and Manchin. The $908 billion package will carve out uh, much needed relief for a four month period. It's not as ex exactly as ambitious as the May uh, 2020 package, the HEROES Act that we passed and I was a co-sponsor of uh, out of the House of Representatives. But indeed it is this uh, new package, which we hope will get through Congress this week, uh, will provide $748 billion for healthcare, schools, nutrition, and other uh, less controversial issues. The $160 billion for state and local governments are being paired with a temporary liability shield in a, a separate act. Um, so this two-part bill, which uh, I am told will be introduced this afternoon, will be uh, much debated. But I, at the end of the day, do believe that we do need another round of stimulus checks to be provided to American citizens. Getting money directly to the hands of the people, I think, is the most effective way to stimulate this economy. Now, these are broad issues, and I, I know that everyone will be glued to their to their television sets to see what actually happens. Uh, for me, the most important thing is providing immediate relief, relief to our essential workers, our healthcare providers, our small businesses, our working families. These are the critical issues that are most important to the people that I represent. I'm happy that we're seeing such innovation when it comes to the vaccine and the therapies and the treatments that have come about so quickly. Uh, I know that it's critically important that we have an equitable distribution of uh, the, the vaccine, but also it's important that we have clinical trials that uh, represent the full diversity of an American citizenry. I think it's critically important that we have trusted advisors and influencers in our communities to make sure that people are getting the right outreach and the right information in order to make the best decisions for themselves and their families. I again thank the Chamber for putting on today's event. I look forward to the questions that you may ask and I wanted to provide a little overview of what may be coming down as another COVID relief package. Thanks again for the opportunity to represent Alabama's 7th Congressional District and the opportunity to present and to talk to you today about innovation and about clinical trials and what's new going on in COVID-19 uh, for Alabama and the rest of this nation. Thanks. Thank you, Congressman. We really appreciate your important work and also sharing your insights with us today. Uh, clearly, there are things that are impacting your constituents that we've never had to deal with before at this level or this scope. And your comments, I think, are really showing just how seriously leadership in Congress is taking the situation and all the things that you're doing in response. So thank you for that. I think you know the Chamber stands with you and hoping that we see another relief package passed soon, along with a lot of the other important work Congress must do. I think sometimes people lose sight of the fact that it really takes strong leadership of the kind you're displaying to really address these serious issues. You know, when we first saw the pandemic beginning to really uh, take root, uh, the chamber responded quickly. Many of our companies have been at the forefront of the response. And GIPC, the Global Innovation Policy Center, created an interactive map which really shows all of the work that's happening across the country, across America, and really across the world. But over 700 clinical trials are happening here in the United States. And we break those down by congressional districts. And it's amazing to know that the map shows there are currently 26 clinical trials for COVID-19 related therapeutics and vaccines taking place across Alabama, with 17 taking place in your very own congressional district. Now, you touched on something that's very very important in terms of uh, the need for these clinical trials to be inclusive and the need for all folks to be represented. But can you tell us a bit more about why you believe it's so important to run these cutting edge clinical trials in your district and the benefits these trials bring to COVID-19 patients and also possibly some of the benefits to the local economy? 
Absolutely. Uh, thanks again, Frank, for the opportunity to speak about this. You know, uh, since the pandemic began, we saw a disproportionate effect on the African American and people of color across this nation, whether it was Black, Latina, uh, Native American. We saw that COVID-19 incidences of confirmed cases as well as death disproportionately represented by communities of color. I am excited about the 26 uh, clinical trials that are going on uh, and uh, therapeutic related uh, uh, activity going on in the state of Alabama and especially excited about the 17 taking place in my congressional district. There's an ongoing need for more diverse candidates to participate in COVID-19 vaccine trials because, as, we, as I've said, we see a disproportionate amount of people of color being affected. Here in Alabama and across the nation, um, we have seen um, that while we only make up 26% of the population, people of uh, African Americans in the state of Alabama, we make up around 38% uh, of the confirmed cases and 36% of the confirmed deaths uh, due to COVID-19. I think that any therapeutic and any vaccine needs to have uh, uh, clinical trials that that, ex that really do reflect the diversity that is in America in order to be truly effective. And it's important because minority communities often take longer to outreach to, um, and because we've had a history, especially in the state of Alabama, with the Tuskegee experiment, um, uh, the syphilis trials that took place, um, there is a suspicion uh, within the African American community uh, from government related uh, clinical trials. And so I think now more than ever, given the importance of this vaccine and the rollout of this vaccine, that we have trusted uh, community influencers, uh, healthcare professionals of color, making sure that we are directing our um, citizens, citizenry uh, to the effectiveness and the safety of these vaccines. Um, as we all know, um, the uh, uh, Pfizer vaccine was approved by the FDA and has rolled out in England and is beginning its rollout in America today. Um, I look forward to um, being uh, one of those hopefully trusted advisors uh, and, and community influencers that will um, will uh, help lead the effort uh, in making sure the people of my district uh, get vaccinated um, as we try to contain and put an end uh, to this uh, to this COVID-19 pandemic. When I think about the importance of innovation, of trade, of of um, spurring, um, you know, innovation uh, throughout this country. I think about uh, the great uh, entrepreneurial center that we have in Birmingham that has been a leading effort in biotechnology and biomedicines all throughout uh, this nation, uh, but uh, originating right here in Alabama with the tremendous resource that we have with the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and their health uh, center um, throughout the state. I know that in Selma, we have amazing uh, community health centers like, uh, like um, the, rural, uh, the Rural Medical Health Program uh, that Cache uh, um, uh, Dozier Smith runs, and so many wonderful providers all throughout the Black Belt. Many have been strapped with uh, lack of resources, was very uh, pleased that they could use some of the CARES money in order to address the, 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 the gaps uh, that exist. But you know, this COVID pandemic has put a spotlight on systemic disinvestment uh, that exists in rural America and uh, the dis, uh, that exists in underserved um, uh, communities of color. And so I think that the real test will be in trying to make sure that we have targeted response, uh, targeted efforts and outreach, uh, and in testing and in treatment uh, for these communities. And I look forward to being a lead, leading advocate on making sure that that occurs in Congress. Well, thank you for that, Congresswoman. You certainly highlight a tremendously important issue. You know, the Chamber, in a very, very uh, challenging year, has made an additional commitment to uh, the issue of equality of opportunity uh, across the board. Um, and we're very pleased that we will be hosting an event that will address some of the very issues you just mentioned in terms of access and participation in clinical trials. You know, just following up on some of your comments, just on Friday, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization for the first COVID-19 vaccine, which you mentioned is starting to roll out today. 
Yet, as you also mentioned, recent polling has shown that less than 50% of the African American community in America plans to get the vaccine once it is widely available. Now, despite the fact that minority communities have been adversely impacted by COVID-19, you know, we see this reluctance for the black community to actually perhaps participate. And you've already cited some of the very real concerns folks have and the skepticism. So what more do you think government can do? And also, what role does the business community have to help ensure the public that the vaccine is safe and effective and it's in their best interest to take it? Yeah, I think that the, the critical issue will be uh, having a, a, a real outreach campaign that's led uh, from the top down. Uh, you know, I think that one of the things that has been most uh, frustrating for me is a lack of a coordinated federal response to this pandemic. Um, but I do believe um, that as we uh, move into a new Congress, 117th Congress and a new administration, that I've seen um, evidence of uh, efforts to really get a more coordinated federal response. Um, you know, it's true that we live in a, a um, a capitalist society where uh, rugged individualism is, uh, is a hallmark of our capitalist society. But you know, when we have these kinds of pandemic and um, every person's um, actions affect others around them uh, because of the spread of this uh, virus, it's critically important that we have trusted uh, leadership from the very top, that that leadership is reflective of the community at large so having a very good representation of healthcare professionals, um, as well as public health officials um, and scientists and um, you know, uh, all the important elements uh, in dealing with this pandemic to make sure that we are getting the right information out to the public will be critically important. I know that I sit on the House Ways and Means Committee, but uh, most importantly, our chairman, Chairman Neal, uh, uh, due to some urging by myself and others, set up a special task force called the uh, Rural Health uh, and Underserved Communities uh, Task Force, where we're looking specifically at social determinants of health that are critically important in underserved uh, rural communities uh, and underserved urban communities all throughout this nation. One of the things that we found is lack of access uh, to uh, medicines, lack of access to transportation to get to those important uh, doctor's appointments. And like Likewise, we've seen a huge uh, spotlight put on the disinvestments of something that I've been fighting for for the whole five terms that I've been in Congress, and that is uh, rural infrastructure, making sure that we get broadband, which is critically important for distant learning right now, and for telehealth uh, to close some of these systemic gaps. I think that what the business community and what healthcare professionals can do is to help us spread the word, to spread the good news about the therapeutics that have been, um, that are effective and that are safe and that we get uh, these trusted uh, community leaders uh, and healthcare professional and scientists uh, on the forefront of communicating directly to people where they live and where they work uh, will be critically important. Um, part of what we've done in our task force is identified more money that needs to be spent in rolling out broadband. You know, when you think about the fact that this great nation of ours rolled out electricity at the beginning of the century with, uh, with, uh, with rural cooperatives and the like, now more than ever, we need to roll out modern day electricity, which is uh, the internet, um, that you have to have broadband in every hamlet, in every village, in every community. And that will be a major part of the recovery effort, but it's also a major part of the current COVID relief effort as we try to stem the tide of the, spray, uh, the spreading pandemic. Um, and so, you know, for me, representing a majority minority district that is 61% African-American, Nothing is more critically important in having um, a real communication and outreach effort that meets people where they are uh, to get them the good news about these vaccines so that people can feel comfortable getting them. You know, I think uh, just like it was important for people like myself to be seen uh, being getting the COVID test to show people how easy it was to do a drive up COVID test. It's going to be equally as important to have um, trusted community leaders and business leaders all throughout uh, our, um, our nation um, getting that vaccine to show that it is both effective as well as safe.
Yeah, we couldn't agree more with that. You know, you earlier talked about how the innovation ecosystem is alive and well in your district. And later in the event, we'll hear from a small cross-section of some of the players from the academic startup and biotech communities who have led the way in response to COVID-19 in your district in Alabama 7. Now, across the innovative community and certainly at the chamber, we believe that intellectual property, correct intellectual property policies and protections are key to fostering the research and development for these new tests, therapeutics, and vaccines. You know, can you just talk briefly about some of the ways that IP policy has helped sustain the investment in R&D back in Alabama and in your own district? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, intellectual property and protecting uh, the United States intellectual property is critically important in all avenues. You know, what, what sets our nation apart is the fact that we have a tradition of innovation, but we have got to create the, both the business environment, the financial incentives, as well as being able to protect uh, those intellectual property um, uh, and trademarks uh, that come out of, um, of our ecosystem. Having strong IP protections in our trade agreements is critically important. I had the opportunity to serve uh, as one of the seven Democrats that uh, Speaker Pelosi chose to negotiate uh, with um, the Trump administration and uh, for the uh, Mexico-Canada uh, uh, U.S. Trade Agreement, U.S. Uh, MCA, um, which was a new NAFTA. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that we really negotiated very strong intellectual property uh, provisions that I think will be the hallmark for future trade agreements. Um, it's important because we need to ensure that we are exporting our standards around the world and combating um, IP theft and abuses by foreign adversaries like China. Uh, I have to say that one of the biggest violators of uh, IP provisions has been China. Uh, we also need to reform and recommit to the World Trade Organization. And while I agree with the Trump administration's diagnos uh, diagnosis of Chinese IP abuses, I think that it has become clear that our strategy of using 301 tariffs against China and other um, global uh, foreign uh, adversaries that have abused IP has uh, produced little uh, IP results and reform. Instead, we've seen the price of goods and services go up. I believe that the only way that we can change the behavior of China and other bad actors is that we work together with our global partners and allies around the world to put international pressure on China. We also, uh, I believe, must be very um, conscious about balancing the need to foster innovation while also pursuing that, um, you know, ensuring that medicine is accessible and affordable to all uh, uh, Americans and all constituents. This will continue to be a fierce debate in our trade agreements, and I hope to be a pragmatic voice within the Democratic caucus and within Congress in trying to balance the need of fostering innovation on the one hand, but also making sure that these therapeutics and these medicines are, are quality, effective, accessible and affordable to my constituents as well. Absolutely, Congresswoman. And, you know, as a member of the House Ways and Means uh, Subcommittee on Trade and also on Health, you know, you have a unique perspective on the ways effective trade policy stimulates exports, creates jobs, and fosters greater competitiveness in your district and across, across the country. And, you know, you just touched on uh, the most recent major trade agreement, uh, the USMCA. But what role can trade policy play further in ensuring that the innovative creators, uh, the innovations created in your district reach the hands of global consumers? Great question. You know, my goal in Congress from the moment I ran for Congress uh, to right now has been to bring economic opportunity, better resources, more opportunities to the people of the 7th Congressional District. It is my home district. I had the great honor before becoming a member of Congress while a student in college to um, intern for my member of Congress, who at the time was Richard Shelby. He's now the United States Senator. He was a Democrat back then. I remind him of that often. But the point is, I think that providing better economic opportunity has to be the hallmark uh, for a district that has many needs like mine. And encouraging that economic development means that we must use everything in our toolbox in order to, to utilize uh, and be able to expand opportunities and access for the people. That includes uh, utilizing, um, you know, tax incentives, utilizing trade, utilizing innovation in both biotechnology and, and, and biomedicine. Uh, I think trade 
trade agreements, as long as they are fair and open um, and are, are, are good for both uh, workers as well as management, are, cre are, are key ingredients uh, for part of that, uh, uh, that revitalization and economic opportunities. Trade agreements can open markets and boast economic returns at home. International trade, including exports and imports, support hundreds of thousands of jobs in Alabama. We're proud in our district to have Mercedes-Benz and Hyundai and Honda and, and so many wonderful uh, automotives being built right in Alabama, made in Alabama. Uh, in, 20, in 2016, for example, 42% of Alabama's goods uh, export goods exports uh, went to free trade uh, agreement partners. And so when we think about the 42% of our exports going to our trade agreement partners, that is critically important for Alabama's economic viability, but also for my district. That was an increase of 83% over 10 years largely due to the automotive industry. But export growth increases jobs by generating new businesses for Alabama manufacturers, for service providers, for our farmers. Uh, imports support jobs and keep costs low and help Alabama businesses compete, saving Alabama families uh, their hard-earned dollars. And overall, I believe that trade, when done right, when done with an eye towards uh, being able to motivate and incentivize uh, uh, fair and free trade supports higher wages for workers and lower costs uh, for companies and consumers, providing them with more money to spend on other things, which has a ripple effect all throughout our economy. So once again, I see my role, especially um, as a member of the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Trade and on Health, is figuring out ways that I can utilize the federal government's policies to promote uh, innovation, to promote better jobs and wages, and to promote economic revitalization for much needed downtown and Main Street revitalization. Well, Congressman, you have been most generous with your time, and it's been a real honor uh, to visit with you and also a pleasure to get your perspectives and insights. Uh, we want to thank you for your leadership, for your hard work, and your dedication to serving the people of your district and the entire country. So on behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Thank you for taking time to join us today. We look forward to continued dialogue and working to support you and your great work uh, in Congress and on the Important Ways and Means Committee. Thanks so much for today. Stay safe, happy holidays, and we hope that you and your constituents uh, are gonna turn the corner on this crisis very quickly. Well, thank you again. And I wanna say in closing, never has it been more important for us to unite as one community, as one nation, to fight this pandemic. I hope that my constituents know how much I am fighting for them each and every day in Congress, but also how I know that we can get through this because our district has been a resilient district. When I think about the legacy that is Alabama's 7th Congressional District, a, a district that brought us the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that brought us the Voting Rights Act of 1965, I know that we have learned to do more with less. But today, as always, we must unite in helping our fellow Americans, our fellow Alabamians, our fellow constituents and friends uh, deal with this pandemic by doing our part. The holiday season is a time for remembrance and for celebration, but let's do so safely as we remember to keep our masks on, to socially distance, and also rigorous sanitation. Now more than ever, we must band together. I also want to announce that this Thursday, I will be doing a telephone town hall to talk about COVID-19, both the vaccination rollout, those of that, as well as the safety uh, guidelines and precautions that we need for the holiday season. Again, thank you so much, Frank. And I wanna thank the Alabama, I mean, the Selma Dallas County uh, Chamber for all of their work in our communities. Thanks again. Thanks, Congresswoman. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, our Senior Vice President of the Global Innovation Policy Center, Patrick Kilbride, who will lead our next panel discussion. Uh, Patrick? Thanks very much, Frank. Thank you, Congressman Sewell. Uh, your, your leadership uh, is, is so appreciated, especially at this important time. But not only uh, the leadership from you and other members of Congress uh, at the national level, but maybe uh, particularly the, the leadership that we've seen from local uh, leaders through 
in communities throughout Alabama and the United States. And, and this is probably a great time with um, the, the welcome announcement of the vaccine rollout beginning over the weekend to thank the uh, millions of Americans and, and many thousands of people throughout Alabama who have participated in the clinical trials that are helping doctors identify solutions and scientists uh, identify vaccines. So, so thank you to all of you who have taken the, taken the lead uh, in, in your local community to make that possible. We're joined by two very important uh, leaders from the Congresswoman's Congressional District today. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Maycock is the assistant professor uh, at the School of Medicine for the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, Dr. Jim Cochran is the associate dean for research at the Culverhouse College of Business at the University of Alabama. Uh, both of them have taken on uh, quite different but very important roles in the COVID-19 response. And I'd like to welcome them and thank them for their leadership and their participation today to help get some important messages out. Um, maybe we could begin with you, Dr. Maycock. Um, in, in addition to your uh, teaching role, you're the program director at the Selma Family Medicine Residency at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of the Family res Medical Medicine Residency in the COVID-19 response? Yes, um, thank you. Um, like you said, I am the program director of the Family Medicine Residency Program here in Selma, Alabama. Um, this program's been here for about uh, over 40 years. And during this pandemic, we have we currently serve as the hospitalist for our, our site hospital, which is Vaughn Regional Medical Center. Um, and so we care for the majority of the patients um, at the hospital, including all the patients that have COVID-19. Um, during that time, you know, we have been on the front lines seeing the impact that COVID has had not only on our patients, but on our nursing staff and all and our providers and our support staff at the hospital. We've come to realize that COVID is no respecter of persons. It affects our staff and patients across uh, demographic and socioeconomic lines. And we've worked hard to stretch our limited resources that we have here to meet the needs of our community. So we've worked in, in um, COVID, uh, COVID coalitions to help to come up with plans so that we can, um, and backup plans so that we can mitigate the different surges that might be, um, that might be coming down the pike. Um, right now, we are, it is anticipated that in the next, uh, it's projected that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a continued surge, uh, you know, an increase of almost 30%. And so we are making plans to try to um, deal with that. And so that is very, um, that, that's a very difficult thing for us to do as well. Um, so, but we, you know, we've trained our, our residents and our um, staff in, you know, proper PPE and, you know, making sure that we all have our, our appropriate PPE and things like that. We've also done things in the community where we've done different Facebook Live events and things like that to help get the, the word out in the community about how to be safe and how to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So we're doing things on, on all sides. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maycock, and our, our hearts and our prayers are, are really with you as you cope with this latest surge. Um, you mentioned communities, and in addition to the Selma Family Medicine Residency um, leadership role in the Doc on the Spot clinics, can you tell us how the, the Doc on the Spot team works uh, in, in the local communities that you serve? Yes, thank you for that. Um, so you're right, we have a, what we, a community free clinic, which we call Doc on the Spot, and it served our, uh, our community for over 12 years providing free medical care for those that don't have insurance. So during the pandemic, it has served to, it is continuing to serve this uh, highly risky community. Um, not only are our regular patients being served, but, we're, but also those affected by the pandemic, whether they, a person has lost a job or if they've lost their coverage due to layoffs or their families have lost their coverage due to uh, lapses in maintaining their health care. So that, those have been the, the goals of our of the patients that we have uh, been able to take care of during this time. Because COVID not only affects our, us 
the individual, but it also affects their entire family. And it's, there's a lot of, um, and so, and a lot of people who are not necessarily affected by the disease itself, they may have been laid off from their job and things like that. And so they might find themselves without um, insurance and things. And so we've been able, also able to educate patients in the proper ways to protect themselves and distributing uh, masks in our community and things like that. Um, the residency program has also been uh, involved in, uh, we sponsored a, a past the pasta food drive so that we can um, help uh, 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 get food for those in of need, in need in our community. And then during uh, 2020, we have served almost 900 patients in our clinic and the clinic is only open once a week. So we've had a tremendous impact on, on our patients as well. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, your, your comments about the spillover effects of the illness uh, give me a good opportunity to bring Dean Cochran into the conversation. Um, Dean Cochran, you're a professor of applied statistics um, which may cause some people uh, to scratch their heads. Uh, tell, tell us why you're here and wh why your work is so relevant to this pandemic. Well, uh, statistics is making a lot of important contributions to the fight against the pandemic, obviously. Uh, I think, uh, for an example, probably the most important statistical concept that, that we have to offer here is random sampling. Uh, that's the way that we can best understand the extent to which the COVID-19 pandemic has actually penetrated our population. We think about what happens when we test only those among us who are symptomatic. Uh, what happens is we potentially badly underestimate the proportion of the population that is infected. And if we do that, that in turn leads us to badly overestimate the proportion of the population that is infected and badly overestimate the death rate for those who have been infected. Now, there are some factors that we have to consider with this, with this too. If somebody gets infected and they almost immediately show symptoms, then uh, taking a random sample of people who are asymptomatic doesn't really do us a whole lot of good. But if that period between the time that someone becomes infected and the first appearance of, appearance of that individual's symptoms grows, that's what we call the incubation period, this problem becomes more severe. Also, as the uh, proportion of infected individuals who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic grows in our population and these people aren't tested, the more severe this underestimation problem becomes. You do have to understand that testing a random sample of a proportion of the population that has not yet shown severe symptoms and has not been tested is absolutely necessary for us to have a better and more accurate understanding of the extent of infection in our population. And with that, that understanding, I'm not really sure how, even if we had a stronger, uh, more coordinated federal response, I don't know how we would design an effective response. Of course, we do have to think about other factors. You know, when there is, for example, a potential shortage of treatment facilities, uh, or there isn't a sufficient number of tests available, then the test certainly must first be administered to those who are symptomatic. We have to take care of the sick individuals first. But the objective overall has to be for our society to produce a sufficient number of tests for both the symptomatic and a routinely collected random sample of the remaining population. That's the only way we really know what's going on with the, uh, the um, pandemic in our country. Yeah, thank you, Dean Cochran. And, and you wrote earlier in the year, uh, I believe for a piece in Significance magazine about the theory of exponential growth. And, you know, it's obviously testing plays a, a critical role in our understanding of how that actually plays out in real, real world. But tell us a little bit about that and its relevance to policy makers here. Sure. Uh, in, in late March, I got a little excited about this as, as the pandemic began to spread throughout parts of our country. Uh, the president and many others started to question how the need for ventilators and masks and other PPE could rapidly increase. I believe the example in one state was that we went from 10,000 to 300,000 in a week or two. And, and this led me to develop several examples 
and then feature them in this article to which you referred to try to help people better understand the nature of exponential growth. And what I'd like to do is take control of the screen and actually show uh, a few demonstrations of these examples to everybody in the audience, if that's okay. Sure. All right, let me uh, take control of the screen. And then uh, as you do that, I, I'd like to uh, then, Dr. Maycock, uh, maybe we, we could get you and Dean Cochran to talk about how the, this applies on the, on the local level. If we're able to, through vaccinations, take one potential spreader out of the community at a time, you know, what does that do um, to the overall rate of spread? And you know, even before we reach a level of herd immunity, can we make significant inroads against this, uh, this virus? So does everybody see a PowerPoint slide on the screen now, fly me to the moon? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So in this first example, we consider something really simple and kind of trivial. How many times would we have to fold a one-tenth of one centimeter thick sheet of paper in order for the thickness to actually reach the moon? Right? And this sounds like a kind of silly example, but it really does make the point. Now, each time we fold the sheet of paper, it doubles in thickness over the previous time it was folded. So we fold our one millimeter sheet, uh, thick sheet of paper the first time, and now it's, uh, the result is two tenths of a millimeter thick. We fold again, we get four tenths of a millimeter thick. And we keep folding and folding and folding. Pretty soon we're up to six millimeters, 12. We keep folding this thing. Uh, we get up to around, oh, I don't know, 15 or 16 times we folded it till we finally get something that, that, that we can measure in kilometers, so something really meaningful. And we keep folding and folding and folding. Uh, ultimately, at 24 folds, we get over a kilometer thick. That's pretty incredible. This tiny, thin sheet of paper, if we fold it 24 times over, it is almost two kilometers thick. So we keep folding and folding and folding and on and on and on. We're up to 35 folds. We're over uh, 3,000 kilometers thick. Keep folding and folding and folding. We haven't gotten, oh, there we go. At 42 folds, we reach the moon. If you could possibly take this one millimeter sheet of paper and fold it 42 times over, you would reach the moon with its thickness. And if you keep folding, Without too much more effort, other than the fact that folding this paper that many times is impossible, you get to Mars and Venus and Mercury in 49 folds. You go to 51 folds, you get to the sun. All right, so it, that's really a very counterintuitive example, right? In the second example I have, uh, I'm going to make a deal with you. Let's suppose I offer to clean your home every day for one month. And on the first day, you pay me one penny. Great deal. Every day after that, you triple what you pay me. All right, so on the first day, you pay me a penny. The second day, you pay me three. The third day, you pay me nine. The fourth, 27 cents. Pretty good deal for you so far. We keep tripling. All right, pretty soon, you're up to paying me almost $200 a day to clean your house. You keep folding and folding. At 12 days, we get almost to $2,000 a day. At 14 days, we're over 10,000. We keep folding and folding and folding. We're over a million. We're over 10 million. We're over 100 million at 20, 22 folds. At 25 folds, we're over $2 billion. You owe me for that day. At 31 days, and I took 31 days so I'd make as much money as possible, you owe me 2,058,911,000 320, I'm sorry, 911 million, 320,000, 946 dollars and 49 cents. This is over 2% of what we estimated the world GNP would be before the COVID-19 virus hit. And uh, it's okay because I will take a check. Okay, now you might say, what happens if, if we didn't triple the money every day? What happens if we just doubled it? That must be what's going on. So, okay, Let's double the money every day. This is what you end up with. Now you only owe me on day 31, $10,737,000. And again, it's okay, I'll take a check. 
Now, what happens if we cut it in half again and you only increase how much you pay me by 50% each day? At the end of 31 days, you still owe me almost $2,000 a day for cleaning your home. That to me is still a pretty good wage, pretty good day's wage. Last example I'll provide you is how quickly something can spread. All right, let's say virus or, or misinformation. Let's suppose that one person has this misinformation or this virus and they're gonna spread it to two people. And every person that gets this misinformation or virus in one hour will spread it to just two other people each. All right, this is what's gonna happen. Over the course of 24 hours, that virus or that misinformation will spread to almost 34,000 individuals. It spreads rapidly, all right? This is what happens with exponential growth. So you might say, how does this discussion apply to the rapid growth and need for ventilators or masks or other PPE. We can use some fairly straightforward math to show that if the need for masks doubles every time period, every day, every week, whatever time period we wanna consider, we go from needing 10,000 masks during a time period to needing at least 3,000, 300,000 masks during a time period in only five time periods. This is uh, this is powerful, uh, Dean Cochran, and you know, uh, Dr. Maycock. Uh, it would seem that it really makes the case for in our local communities, if we, if we can reduce that compounding of the spread, we can make difference uh, at home for everyone. I, I I wonder, you know, with this vaccine rolling out, um, how, how do you speak to? people in, in the local community about uh, the importance of, of getting a vaccine once it's available? Um, well, that's a very good question. So like you said, it is important for us to recognize the things that are going to increase the likelihood of us spreading the disease, if, even if we're asymptomatic, meaning we don't have symptoms, we can still carry the, the, the virus and s spread it to other people. And I, I see the impact of that a lot you know, in, our, in the hospital, as well as in the nursing home. We take care of patients in three different nursing homes here in Selma. And so we see that because those patients aren't going anywhere, but their, their caregivers are. And so their caregivers are, are going to Walmart and they're going all sorts of places and doing things. And so, and then they are asymptomatic and bringing them back. And so having those, uh, having those asymptomatic checks to make sure that those, those you know, those uh, caregivers unknowingly aren't giving their, the, the patients the virus is very important. Um, it's also important because we don't know um, about how, because a lot of people are asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. It is important for us to get vaccinated so that we can build up an immunity to the, the virus so that we don't, if we get, contract the virus, we're not spreading it unknowingly to other people. And so at this point, it's not so much about it is about protecting ourselves, but it's also about protecting our loved ones because we don't know who who has it and who does it and who is giving it to other people. That it's so imperative that not only do we do it for ourselves, but we need to do it for our loved ones and those that we care for. You know, at those that we come into contact with at the store or at the gas station or at church or anywhere. Um, it's important that we um, we we have to unite on this issue and do things together as a, as a unified force and not, and not be selfish and think that, well, I don't have it or I'm, I'm going to, or if, if I get sick, it's not going to be that big of a deal, which it might not be for you, but it might be devastating for someone you love. Well, thank, thank you so much. So, um, very important messages. Uh, Dr. Maycock, uh, your leadership in the local community is so much appreciated. Dr. Cochran, um, your work to really help us understand the dynamics behind this is so valuable. Thank you both very much. We're going to turn now to uh, the, the panel with local business leaders uh, and hand over the moderation to my colleague Kelly Anderson, who's the Chamber's Director for uh, Health Innov Innovation within the Innovation Policy Center. Thank you very Thanks much. so much, Patrick. Um, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Kelly Anderson. I'm the Senior Director of Health and Drug Policy at the Chamber's GIPC. I'm honored to be here to moderate this conversation with 
some of the leading innovative minds in Alabama. So joining us today, we have Leverett Powell, who's the co-founder of Agile Biodetection. We have Dr. Sue Feldman, who's a, a professor and director of graduate programs in health informatics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And finally, we have Carter Wells, who's the vice president for economic development at the Hudson Alfred Institute for Biotechnology. So Leverett, let's start, uh, let's start with you. Um, so while much attention has been given to the large multinational companies that have played a pivotal role in the fight against COVID-19, with good reason, of course, um, the startup community has been equally critical in the response as well. Um, and we think, you know, agile biodetection is a really great example of the way startups in Alabama responded to the call to help combat and defeat COVID-19 in your community. Can you tell us a little bit more about the innovative technology that you guys are developing? Uh, absolutely. So Agile actually started as a pivot from um, another startup we're involved with in Tuscaloosa. So we had to pivot from the food industry, uh, which has been wrecked very hard from uh, the COVID side. And we actually put together a team very quickly to work on identifying the pathogens within our work environment, be it the kitchens to, uh, to transit, whatever. And what we've seen in the past is there's always been a concern about pathogens in our public spaces and environments. Um, however, it's been mainly focused on food and pharmaceutical and medical. Uh, but uh, COVID-19 has led to the increased demand that we know what's in our environment. Proof that the various locations, be it schools, restaurants, or public transportation is pathogen free. And that's what we've put a lot of stake into. And we've licensed some technology from Harvard and put together our own lab. This is, I'm um, actually buying in it right now. So that spurred innovation in our area to build out a brand new lab in the past two months. But basically just detecting COVID within the, our environment to help, not just right this second, but when we come out of this pandemic, we have to rebuild that consumer confidence, that confidence that our communities, our workplaces uh, are all pathogen free. Absolutely. I think that's going to be uh, really critical to putting us on the re return to normal um, once again. So from one innovative technology to another, uh, Dr. Feldman, I understand that you lead the GuideSafe project, including the GuideSafe app, which is now being used for early COVID-19 exposure notification, both statewide and beyond. Can you tell us a little bit more about the app and how um, it's a really invaluable tool to stem the spread of coronavirus in your community? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And I have to say we're grateful to Governor Ivey for providing CARES Act funds um, uh, for this added protection for every community, regardless of where you live uh, across our state. So much of what has been talked about by those who presented before me can be addressed by using the GuideSafe exposure notification app on your phone. So the idea here is to decrease exposure as a way to mitigate spread. The earlier that you are notified, the the more you can do to mitigate spread. The GuideSafe Exposure Notification app allows you to be notified as much as a week earlier that you have come in contact with someone who later reports their positive COVID-19 test. I think it's important to understand what the app does, but even more so what it does not do. Typically when you download an app, you need to give permissions um, to access all sorts of things on your phone. You know, and you might even wonder why. With GuideSafe um, Exposure Notification app, you simply go to the app, or Play Store, type in Guide Safe, all one word, and install and download. The only question you'll be asked is to allow for exposure notifications. You will not be asked for access to your calendar, to your contacts, to photos, social media, your location. The app does not collect any of that. Um, it does not access any of your personal information on your phone. You just download the app and you let it work. Now, how does it work? So then when you're within six feet for 15 minutes of longer or longer, of someone um, else who has the app downloaded, the two phones will exchange an anonymous encrypted key or a code. Then later, if one of these people reports their positive test in the app, they supply their phone number, which is only used to create a one-way cryptographic code. Then the phone number is destroyed and the cryptographic code is stored on the server. When the health department gets that same positive test from that same person, they create a one-way cryptographic code from the phone number that's on that lab test. Same as what we did when they submitted it in the app. When those two one-way cryptographic codes meet and match on the server, notifications are sent out broadly. 
Love me. <laughs> Thanks so much for that really helpful explanation of what the app does and doesn't do. I know, you know, many people had uh, concerns about privacy when these apps were originally developed. So I think it's um, really important to tell people, you know, the only things that the app does and how important that is for, for public health in your communities. Um, so Carter, let's, let's bring you into the conversation here. So Hudson Alpha has been actively engaged in a variety of ways in the fight to combat COVID-19. And you know, I think if there's been any silver lining um, in this global pandemic, it's been the unprecedented scale and scope of partnership taking place between companies, universities, nonprofit, nonprofits, hospitals, the government. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the collaboration taking place between the Institute's nonprofit genomic research labs and biotech companies? Sure, happy to. And uh, thanks to Representative Stuhl for her work for her district, but also for what she does for the state of Alabama and to the U.S. Chamber's Global uh, Innovation Policy by Alabama and Selma and Dallas County Chamber for including Hudson Alpha today. Uh, Hudson Alpha is a nonprofit institute located in Madison County, but we work to interact and serve the entire state of Alabama. Um, Hudson Alpha was created with innovation and collaboration as the foundation. We have discovery-based academic style genomic research going on, uh, but then also um, uh, specifically within uh, COVID-19. Uh, also on our campus, we've got 45 biotech companies that are working on anything from long league drug development and discovery to diagnostics to medical devices and various products and services. And right now there are probably over a dozen companies on the Hudson Alpha campus that have joined uh, the fight in this global pandemic. Um, but let me highlight just two examples of these collaborations. Um, uh, the first one is working to help the collective efforts of policymakers and frontline workers through genomic sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we're working with the Alabama Par Department of Public Health, the Governor's Coronavirus, Coronavirus Relief Fund, and a number of entities around the state on this initiative. Um, the goals of this initiative are to identify the different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus from all the regions of the state to generate longitudinal data to determine the changes within the SARS-CoV-2 virus, to identify possible sources of new hotspots of infection within the state of Alabama. And something that really drew us to start with was to add an Alabama perspective to the national and global uh, COVID-19 initiatives through uh, sequencing data that was generated, that was not being gener generated in the state. And all of this information that we are generating from around the state uh, will be provided to the Alabama Department of Public Health and the other parties that have critical roles in responding to this pandemic. Um, we're working also with the Alabama-based diagnostic companies, hospitals, and health organizations to obtain the samples from all the regions, if not every county in the state. Uh, the main reason for that specifically uh, we're working on a state initiative here, and we want to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, geographic and demographic coverage throughout the state. And the, the second, I'll, I'll highlight this briefly, involves Hudson Alpha uh, and our, our work in uh, the genomic sequencing space, but then also clinicians from the Huntsville Hospital uh, system throughout North Alabama, and then two Alabama-based biotech companies, uh, iRepertoire and Foresight, that are housed on the Hudson Alpha campus. This collaboration specifically is focused on developing therapeutics for COVID-19. Yeah, I think those examples really go to show um, how important it is to find these synergies in local communities and, and make those partnerships in order to really address the challenge that we face. Uh, so Leverett, in a, in a similar vein there, you mentioned that you licensed the technology you developed from Harvard's Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Um, can you share with our audience how these licensing agreements ensure that innovations that were initially researched in universities can be developed and commercialized so they can eventually reach the hands of consumers? Absolutely. So um, when we started our research on all this, we figured out that there was sorry, some existing technology that we could leverage. And we basically took our IP, uh, our analysis and our theories, and we started on getting our own IP protection started. And that actually was a little bit of a delay, but when we reached out to Harvard, it was really great because through there, they explained to us because of the pandemic, they set up a framework and that's shared with about 24 other universities across the US. 
And um, that framework allows us to have royalty-free licensing of certain IP related to the COVID pandemic. And that has dramatically opened the door to us. It allowed us to uh, license a second piece of technology um, through collaboration with them, uh, with the people at the White Institute, where they basically said, hey, this would also help you sequence faster. And ultimately, our end product is a small device that is deployed out in the field that's cheap, but it's able to run the test even cheaper, uh, or uh, very fast and uh, low cost and accurate. And that's our goal, so our device can be deployed to work environments like a McDonald's or to a school system or to an uh, airline or a bus system so we can detect pathogens. But what was nice about working with Harvard is they latched onto that and worked with us to help us identify the licensing that we needed to do. And then the icing on the cake for everything was for them to tell us we have royalty free access to this to get us started. It's reviewed and then at some point we'll transition to traditional licensing. But I think this type of licensing concepts will help spur innovation even past COVID because I can see other um, innovation initiatives being started. May it be power four years from now, it could be something else. So I really want to give hats off to Harvard and um, all of them that have put together this framework. And it's opened up again to 24 other universities. The only university in Alabama that's part of this is the University of South Alabama. And it was nice to actually speak to them the other day about this framework and what we're doing and hearing their thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, we at the Chamber really think that when it comes to driving life sciences innovation, the public policy really matters. So, you know, for that reason, reason we've been strong advocates for uh, the Bayh-Dole legislation, which just celebrated its 40th anniversary over the weekend, which created the framework that you just described to move, um, you know, technology created at universities to, um, to private companies so that they can um, commercialize that technology. So it's really interesting to hear of a real life example of that uh, taking place uh, during, during this, uh, the time in which we find ourselves. Um, so Dr. Feldman, I know you have another example of, of a partnership and how that's been so important. Um, you recently announced a partnership with the PathCheck uh, Foundation to use your test verification technology in other states. Uh, can you share more information about how this collaboration will help ensure that the UAB developed innovation will be used to help tackle coronavirus in states and in other states and countries? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so right here at UAB, my colleagues Brian Rivers and Rajesh Pillai developed a way to ensure test verification without involving humans. Um, one of the things that uh, that people were concerned about, in addition to privacy, uh, when we first developed uh, the exposure notification app, was uh, nefarious activity. So people submitting uh, positive tests and they had no way to be verified. Uh, the other situation that was at a crossroads with this was that public health departments were overwhelmed. And so they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, spare the bandwidth to be able to answer phones to give people uh, test validation numbers. And, uh, and so what, uh, what my colleagues Brian Rivers and Rajesh Pillai came up with is this one-way cryptographic code that I explained earlier. Uh, in many states that have, uh, have adopted the same exposure notification technology that we have here in Alabama, which incidentally is developed in a collaboration with ADPH and Google and Apple, uh, in many states, a positive test verification involves a phone call to a person. Uh, and so, uh, so the PathCheck Foundation develops exposure notification app for other states and countries. Uh, and they thought that our test verification technology could be helpful for those other states and countries. And, uh, and so we also just onboarded with this technology to the national key server. Uh, when the Department of Health, and so let me give a little bit of background uh, and then you'll see how this all comes together. When the Department of Health conducts traditional uh, case contact tracing, uh, where they make a phone call uh, to the person who, with the positive COVID test, uh, this person is reporting only those who they know or who they want to disclose. Uh, we estimate that this misses about 80% of the people who the person, the person with COVID, um, actually came in contact with. 
Uh, so initially, this early IT-enabled exposure notification was contained within our state. Now, with our participation in the national server, as long as people in other states have their state's exposure notification app downloaded, use the app to report a positive test, and they are in one of the 18 states that's onboarded, these notifications will follow you wherever you go. So this is really important because it provides uh, these protections for those who are increasing their mobility beyond the Alabama borders. Yeah, you know, I also think it's a great example of how, you know, a technology uh, that was developed in Alabama is going to have really positive spillover effects um, for public health across the country. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that example. Carter, you know, we're, we're, uh, I'll turn it back to you to close the conversation. And I wanted to loop back to some of the points that were made earlier. Um, you know, we heard both the Congresswoman and Dr. Maycock speak earlier about the ways the COVID-19 pandemic has adversely impacted minority communities. And you've certainly seen this in Alabama. Can you tell us a little bit about Hudson Alpha's efforts to use the technologies developed in Alabama to address the gaps that the coronavirus has so acutely highlighted? Sure, uh, you mentioned uh, both uh, the comments from uh, Representative Sewell earlier, just with the, the real extreme difference in the percentage of the population and of the, um, of the impact and the disproportionate um, impact that has really been seen by COVID. Um, it really exposed a lot of different things within the uh, within certain uh, communities around the state, and you know, with that in mind, and understanding that the um, understanding that backdrop, um, the project that I mentioned earlier, the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing project, um, Hudson Alpha, you know, at the onset of that, really directed efforts to ensure that minority communities are represented, and um, so we've been uh, engaging and interacting with different groups around the state to be able to make sure that we do have a, a representative sample uh, from you know, all the communities within the state, um, both on the geographic side and the demographic side. Um, beyond this initiative, but still related, um, Hudson Alpha is uh, working on a variety of other projects. Um, and one is with Acclinate Genomics, Genetics, excuse me, Acclinate Genetics. Um, and they uh, are working to uh, engage minority populations in genomic research, uh, as well as the applications of the power of genomics. Acclinate, uh, their uh, focus of their business is to ensure a, an increase in representation by minority communities, but they're working, on, uh, working with us on this uh, separate project about applications. And these applications can range really from making sure that the medications that each person takes is the right one, uh, to maybe a different um, uh, part of that uh, range is to identify disease risks. And all of these, you know, th these different applications are based on an individual person's genome. And so, um, like I said, Hudson Alpha is really working with directed efforts, uh, specifically on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequencing project to a lot of the other projects that we're working around the state to make sure that we got uh, targeted and directed um, engagement within uh, a variety of populations. Such important work and you know I, I wish I had time to pepper you with questions all afternoon uh, but you know we've, we've come to the close of our program so I just want to thank you the three of you each for taking the time to join us today to tell us a little bit more about all the good work that's uh, taking place in Alabama. You know, I hope that uh, this event today is just the beginning of a collaboration between uh, the Chamber and innovative, innovative companies like yours um, in the state. So thank you again. Um, you. I'd, in you. Closing, I'd like to turn it to um, our colleague Cheryl Smedley with the Selma and Dallas County Chamber of Commerce, who is kind enough to co-host this event with us. Cheryl, any closing remarks from you? Just want to say thank you today for this very informative uh, information from the panelists and the guests and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much, Cheryl. We're so glad we could co-host this event with you. Frank, I'll turn it back over to you to round out the program. Thanks so much, Kelly, and a special thank you to Congresswoman Sewell and also to all our great panelists for sharing their insights and expertise today. You know, the Congresswoman said it best. We're only going to get through this if we work together 
and we collaborate both within industry and government and everyone pulls in the same direction. So we've seen that happening in record time. Uh, today's first uh, vaccine applications are really a testament to the power of innovation and the commitment our country has put behind beating COVID. And obviously the people of Alabama are at the forefront of that effort. So Kelly, thank you for all your hard work on this program. Thanks again to everyone who participated and also a special thank you to all our speakers. Stay safe, happy holidays, and we look forward to continued collaboration. Stay well. Thank you all.